Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. All right, so uh, let's jump into the, the discussion today on, on DuckDB. Um, and again, as I said last time, like this is going to this is a lot different than all the other systems that we've been talking about, at least in the last last week or so, because all of those are these giant distributed OLAP warehouses running on the cloud. And then now I had you got to re read a paper about DuckDB, who wants to run on a single node. Uh, but we'll talk about Mother Duck at the end, how they, they not necessarily go distributed, meaning fanning out, scaling out the, the queries themselves, but at least now be able to leverage cloud uh, compute infrastructure to, for, for query execution. But we'll see that at the end. All right, so last class we were talking about the Snowflake Data Warehouse. Uh, and as I said, this was uh, along with Dremel, so that one of the first uh, this is what I call classical cloud native uh, OLAP engine that did all the various things that we talked about through the entire semester, like uh, pre-compiled primitive primitives, uh, push-based execution, um, separate and computing storage, and all those nice things. And so this showed up actually, I think, yesterday, uh, which I think worth just looking at, because I think somebody else asked me, like, okay, well, like all these systems at a high level look the same. How do you pick them? Um, so data engineering subreddit is actually really good because there's people actually using these systems and talking about like the, the pros and cons of them. Uh, so I highly recommend it. And so somebody's asking, hey, how do I pick between Snowflake, Databricks, BigQuery, and Redshift? We haven't talked about uh, Redshift yet. Um, that'll be next week. And this dude basically says like, hey, don't worry about the, the nitty gritty details. The, the way to really think about whether you want one system or another is, first of all, what cloud are you already running on? If you're already run, running on GCP or Google, then just use BigQuery. If you're already running on AWS, you could probably just use, uh, you know, Redshift or otherwise. And then if you're, you're, if you're already using Spark, use Databricks. Uh, and then if you have a lot of money uh, and, and looking for a good time, uh, then, that's, <laughs> then that's Snowflake. All right, and I would say that's one of the differentiators I think that Snowflake has done really well that separates them from, from the other systems is just that the user experience is, is much, much better and cleaner than, uh, than these, these other, other cloud systems. And so even though, again, the core architecture might still be the same underneath the covers at a high level, based on the things that we talked about, you know, as I said before, the user experience is going to matter a lot, and also the, uh, you know, how good the query optimizer is. Is there, like, no tuning in Snowflake? Is that why? Uh, his question is, is there's no tuning in Snowflake? Yeah, they don't, they don't expose Anything. really any knobs. You can't even do query plan hints. It's just one knob, right? I think there's one knob you can jack up the compute size. Uh, you can turn off auto-scaling. It's like, I think there's three things. Now, that doesn't mean in, in the actual implementation itself, there aren't a bunch of other knobs. And they told me this. They're like, yeah, we have hundreds of knobs on the inside. Uh, they don't expose them to the users. So then typically what happens is, um, they said is if somebody calls a sales engineer and says, my query is running slow, the sales engineer can then get in touch, or the customer service can get in touch with a, a, a you know, database system engineer. And then they'll recommend like, hey, tune these three, four knobs for this one particular customer, right? But it's very, it's very ad hoc, at least this is what they told me a few years ago. So underneath the covers, they, there's all the tuning knobs that you'd expect, but they don't, to make it your life easier as the user of it, they don't expose it to you. So how are they actually tuning it themselves? It must be really hard to do that, right? The question is how are they actually tuning it themselves? Uh, what do you mean, like how are they tuning themselves? Like, I mean, they have tons of knobs, right? Yes. And like getting those values so out they, So their sort of design philosophy would be like, you want things to be adaptive. Uh, and so, Again, I, it's hard to quantify this, say how much it is actually adaptive, but you can think about it like, instead of being lazy, not lazy is not the right word, but instead of, instead of saying, okay, well, here's some, some value for a knob I need to know about how to set correctly for the workload. Instead of just saying, all right, well, it's a pound to find, somebody else will set it for me, you could, there's ways to make, try to make things adaptive. It's more engineering, certainly, but it makes you more robust. Yes? Why is Redshift not a positive experience? The question is, why is Redshift not a positive experience? Um, We'll come to that next week. <laughs> I, it's not, I, again, I think there's nothing particularly wrong with, with the architecture itself, because uh, they fixed a lot of it. Um, again, it's the user experience, and that's hard to quantify, right? Um, it could be like, okay, my query went slow. I'd be providing the right tools for me to figure out why it ran slow. Um, or is it, you know, how stable is the system in terms of performance? Like, I run the query today, I run it tomorrow, and like, it's an order of magnitude difference in performance. Like, did, you know, is, is, that, is that what people are seeing? Okay, this is purely anecdotal, yeah. right? Um, I just thought it, I thought it was an interesting quip, um, and like I said, the data engineering. This is where you see a lot of people at the sort of bleeding edge talking about how they're using these systems, 
and also the ecosystems around it, like Airflow, DBT, and things like that, and how they integrate with these, uh, these cloud vendors. OK? All right, so uh, for today's discussion, we need to sort of go back in time just a little bit uh, to talk about what led to the creation of, of DuckDB. And you actually already read the, one of the papers that was a precursor or a catalyst for uh, what, what, you know, what set off the development of DuckDB. And that was the, the networking paper, like, don't hold my data hostage. Um, right? And that paper came out of this, this project they were building at CWI uh, to make an embedded version of, of MoneyDB called MoneyDB Lite. Basically, MoneyDB, again, was one of these early column store systems at Academia, at a CWI, that then it was open source and people were actually using. Um, and, but it was, like, you know, it was like a Postgres or any other sort of shared everything system. You had to prop it up, configure it, set it up, and... and you would connect to it through, through JDBC over the, over the network. And so what they were trying to do was to make it faster or easier for data scientists to use a database system inside of like Python Pandas or R. I think this explicitly for R, they were doing this. They tried to make an embedded version that ran in process. We haven't really talked about what an embedded database system looks like, but basically it's, you know, it's, there's no main function like you would starting like Postgres or MySQL. It's running, it only runs whenever the, the, the hosting app process then invokes insight down into it. Now, it can spin up its own threads in the background and do other stuff, uh, but like it's, it, you know, it's not something you, you would just start like as a daemon on, on, your, uh, on your server and just run all the time. So they were trying to, trying to make this run directly inside of the, the R runtime or Pandas runtime, and they were trying to reduce the cost of going back and forth between the R-Lang uh, infrastructure and the database system. Because typically, very often, how data scientists use databases is they just grab a giant CSV or Parquet file, whatever, from the server itself, bring that down to your local laptop, and do all the crunching on that. And so they're not leveraging the database system to do all the fast calculations and stuff that like, you know, we know how to do really well. They're basically rolling all that crap themselves inside of their set of user code. Pandas isn't particularly known to be uh, you know, very, very swift or fast. So that was the goal. They're trying to have an embedded version of MoDB Lite that got all the advantages of the column store and would expose that to the, the data scientists. But the problem with MoDB, you know, at this point, it was 15, 20 years old, and it just had too much sort of legacy infrastructure and legacy code that it was too much to rip things out and, and strip it down to, to get it to be a... A, a more simplistic package that, you, again, you could then embed. So that's what led the, the CWI researchers to develop DuckDB. Right? It's basically their, the time, that the, the, their efforts that they took with MoDB Lite, they, they learned a bunch of lessons from that and said, okay, we, we should build a, clean, uh, a system from scratch, specifically di designed from the beginning to be embedded inside of uh, you know, in, in other applications. So you could call this an embedded data system. Sometimes it's called it in-process. Could technically call it serverless, right? Because again, it's not a daemon that's always always running. Um, but the idea is that they're trying to be a provide a, a, a fast SQL execution engine on on any possible data file you, you could find that, that that you'd possibly want to uh, query, right? Again, this is sort of the same idea in Dremel. They want to be able to take any data file that someone may have in their object store, and you want to run queries real fast on it. So there's the the SQL dialect they're to support is based on Postgres. Uh, they did what we did in, in our early system. We took the Postgres grammar file and just embedded that inside of our, our system. But then over the years, what I've liked is that, well, this is how you get, you know, that's why there isn't a, a single SQL standard. They've added some nice quality of life enhancements uh, that are specific to DuckDB. Like you can just type from and then the table name, and that does the same thing as a select star, things like that. And the pitch, which I think is fantastic from a marketing standpoint, to really understand what DuckDB is trying to be, is it's trying to be the SQL Lite of for analytics, right? SQL Lite is the most widely deployed uh, embedded database system. It's on all your phones and your laptops right here, right now. Uh, it's running satellites in space. It's in every plane, uh, and it's designed to do transactions. Um, and so they wanted to sort of have the same ubiquity of of SQL Lite, the proliferation of it being used by everyone, but specifically for for doing fast analytics. Now Jignesh has a paper with his students. I think came out two or three years ago. They've added some enhancements to SQLite to improve the, you know, its support to do anal analytics. But I, I, I don't think it comes close to what DuckDB can do. 
So another important design decision in terms of the implementation of it is that it's all going to be custom C++ code that they've written uh, for DuckDB. So that means they're, they're, they're going to try to avoid bringing in third-party dependencies when necessary. I think for encryption, SSL stuff, like that, that stuff you want to bring in. You, you don't want to write that yourself. But like a bunch of other stuff, they're not going to rely on uh, third-party packages or, or libraries. They're going to write everything themselves. And this is going to make the system uh, more lightweight, easier to manage from the engineering side of things. Uh, and you have the additional capability of like, now because it's all C++ code that you wrote uh, and not some weird party library, third-party library, they can actually compile it on the WASM and it can, can run in your browser very easily. There's been attempts to get like SQLite, and actually SQLite will run in WASM, but people have tried to get Postgres to run in WASM, and it's always, it always seems like a huge hack uh, to get that to work. Whereas in uh, for DuckDB, it's quite simple. And so the way they're going to be able to expand the, 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 what the system can actually do beyond the sort of core runtime engine, uh, they're going to rely heavily on an extension ecosystem. We'll talk about it in a second. And so they'll have like, the, the official ones that they support, but also you can, you can download arbitrary ones and install them. And that, again, that makes the core engine lightweight and easier for them to manage. So again, like we talked a little bit about when we talked about Photon, like the design philosophy of like, okay, they have to maintain all the Spark Java crap uh, and they want to avoid Java. So Photon was a supposed engine that they invoked down through JNI. Yes? By serverless, what exactly do we mean? Are we talking like Lambda function or something? Yeah, so serverless would be like a Lambda function, meaning like the, the process goes away when like if nothing is actively using it. It's not, so embedded, I think embedded is a better one, like embedded is sort of the same idea. Like if, there has to be some other process already running that then links into the data system and then it is, I don't think you hand it threads the way you do in SQLite. I think you spin up its own threads, okay. but like it's, it's all within the same address space as the host process. It's like a library. It's like a library, yes. Yeah, it's a library, yes. All right, so here's at a high level what the, the major features that are in, in, in DuckDB. And again, the number one difference at the top is going to be that it shared everything versus sh all the shared disk or disaggregated storage stuff we talked about before. Because again, it's an embedded database system. It, it has no notion of a separating compute and storage. I mean, you'll see that they can use extensions to talk to the, the cloud platforms and, and so forth. But the, you know, at its core, it is sort of just, like, just, just a... Uh, just the query engine. Um, it's not entitled to because they do transactions. They, they, they have their own file format. So, but it, it's, again, it's, it's not the like, scaled out architecture that we saw in Dremel and, and others. The new push-based vectorized query processing, we'll spend most of our time talking about this because they actually started doing pool-based. Uh, and then they switched over two years ago, three years ago to push-based. And they talk about all of the challenges they face scaling out uh, a, the, a, a pool-based model and why switching to a bush pace one was better. And again, given the, 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 the provenance of, of, of coming from CWI, where vectorwise was invented, they're gonna do pre-compiled primitives, not, not, it's not a surprise. They use a style of MVCC that's actually based on what the Germans do in Umbra, or sorry, in Hyper. We're not gonna cover this paper, but uh, actually a lot of these are, are based on what the, the Germans did. In some, some ways you can say like, they literally just took the papers and re-implemented the stuff that the, that, that we, of all the papers we talked about today. For example, they're doing morsels. Uh, they're going to do the, 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 the unnesting arbitrary subqueries. They're the only database system other than Hyper and Umbra that can do this. Um, yes? Why would you want morsel parallelism for something that's intended to be embedded maybe like on a pizza box or something? So actually, why would you want morsel parallelism if you, if, you intend to, if you intend to be running on a pizza box? But a pizza box like nowadays has a shitload of cores, right? Wait, do you ever know when I say pizza box, I mean like one unit rack, rack unit. You can put like multiple sockets in those things. Or even the, whatever, the AMD, the Ryzen, the latest one, it's a ton of cores. The Threadripper, thread, like, I forget the exact number now. You can get a ton of cores. So why, why wouldn't you want to use them? Uh, actually, I don't know whether this is actually NumaWare. I don't, the paper doesn't say. But I imagine it's not hard to figure that out, right? They also tell you. Um, like SQLite, is, again, I would say SQLite really was designed to run on like a one-core 
very pure in the CPU, like from the, like the mid 2000s. There's a um, even more stripped down data system called Extreme DB that's running like on uh, like SOCs in like missiles and shit like that, right? Where like if you you, you, know, like you don't you don't even have an operating system, right? There's, so there's systems that even more like uh, low level than that. SQLite's a little bit more, right? And and uh, and in that case, SQLite, I, SQLite can't do parallel query execution. Like, like whatever thread makes the SQL request, that's the one that runs it, I'm fairly certain. Uh, whereas in DuckDB, like one thread would make the request, but then if you tell it how many threads you're allowed to sp spread the query, query, query across, and they use morsels to, to do that schedule. Um, right, so the pack stuff, that we've covered that many, many times. They're gonna do the sort merge join and, and hash joins. And then the stratified query optimizer is, uh, looks very similar to what we talked about before. Again, it, you're running on arbitrary files uh, that you may not have any statistics for. So they're using a bunch of rules to figure out you know, some basic join order heuristics or things like that. Um, but the one thing they do well is the unnesting arbitrary subqueries. Um, they didn't use support so they didn't support unnesting arbitrary subqueries for lateral joins. And as I said, last year in 721, the students actually uh, did that. Like Sam Arch, the PhD student here, they, they got that merged into DuckDB. So they can handle all possible uh, subqueries now. All right, so we're going to spend most of our time talking about the push-based architecture because they, they're going to talk about, it's public about actually how they're going to pass data between the operators, which is something we haven't really discussed. So as I mentioned, the, the original version of, of, of DuckDB uh, prior to 2021 was using a pool-based vectorized uh, execution model with, again, pre-compiled -pre primitives. Um, but then over the years, they found that it was turning out to be uh, cumbersome to, to maintain and, and, and work on because every single time that you wanted to add uh, you know, a new operator and, and make it you know, make it parallel, you had to have sort of modify this, this, this control plane piece to say, okay, here's, here's this parallel thing we, we, can out, we can outrun, right? It was more infrastructure that they had to maintain for every single time they added something new. The other challenge they, they had is that, because now, since they want to be able to support reading data from not necessarily local disk, right? It's a remote file system, they can support HTTPS or S3 and so forth. Now you have this challenge where some pipeline may be blocked because it's getting data over the network, but there are other pipelines you could start running, right? Because they don't need to wait for that data. But if you do a pool-based model, like the Volcano approach, where you're calling get next, get next, get next, the call stack down between the, in the query plan, that's essentially the, the state of where things are being executed. So if you reach the bottom to a leaf node, and, and that leaf node wants to go get remote data, you have no way to like pause it, unwind it, go back up the stack, and then maybe call down another pipeline. Right? Basically, the, the control flow of the, of, of the execution of the query plan is implicitly within those, that call stack. And so, so if they switch to a push-based model, then now you have the, this centralized scheduler using morsels that can say, all right, these are, the, these are the pipelines or tasks that I can run right now. Go ahead and run them. And here's the ones where I know I'm waiting for I.O. For, for whatever reason. And we go put, we pause them and wait. So for them, they found it, just, it was a not just in terms of performance, but in terms of the engineering of, of, of you know, not assuming the data is always readily available, switching to a push-based model turned out to be a, a much better approach for them. And the great thing about it is like, you can read uh, the actual PR, or, or Mark, the, the co-creators of it, of it added, you know, added the push-based model. Um, and now talks about like, you know, all the great things that they were able to achieve with it. All right? What's wrong? What's that? PR is huge. Yeah, I mean, because they ripped out all the, the, the pool-based stuff and switched to a push-based stuff. Who, who are you? Oh, wow. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. There's probably a bunch of PRs like one, right? There's one they just did it all at once, right? They probably did it all at once. <laughs> Mark, Mark's amazing. This is like, like uh, I think this point, 2021, I think he was still a postdoc, right? That, the Dutch model is kind of weird as a PhD student. Like, they're, like C CWI is not a university. It's like a, like, a, like a research consortium of a bunch of other universities. So technically, all the people there, like Peter Bonds, Hannes, uh, well, Martin, he, he died. But like, they were, had affiliations with other universities, but like, they didn't teach classes, really, and, and they just wrote code at CWI, right? 
that, again, this is one of the, the, the pros and cons of like the American, you know, the academic model versus like the, the European one. Like in, in case of German, the, German, the, the Germans, like they get six free PG students a year, right? Yeah. All right, each PG student here cost me $125,000 a year, <laughs> right? So like they're getting a ton of money and, like, and they're top students that are just like can write a ton of code for them. Whereas like we, it's hard to uh, scale up at the same sort of level. Um, and I said CWI, is the same sort of thing. Like, like, like Mark just basically just wrote code full time on DuckDB. So the, I, it doesn't surprise me that he did this entire PR. It means he's also very smart. It's not like, you know, I'm not surprised that he did it. It's just I'm saying like he had the opportunity to do this, even though he's a PG student. OK. So because now they switch to a push-based model, they talk about how they, this opens up a bunch of opportunities to do additional optimizations that you would be very difficult to do, again, in a, in a, in a pool-based model. Again, some of these I think we talked about, but not all of them. So the first one is that because now you have explicit control of when you can basically pause a, uh, a, a pipeline, right? If you, if you, if you, since all the tasks are in this centralized scheduler um, table, if you will, or list, you say, okay, well, this thing is going too fast or going too slow. Let me just prevent any, any more tasks with that pipeline from, from executing. So you can do things like, if I, if I, uh, if my scan's running too fast, actually that's, that's back pressure, but like, you can do things like, if my scan is producing not a lot of data as it's going up, uh, rather than having the, the filter send up a bunch of uh, data that's not um, uh, un, un, uh, em half empty or semi-full vectors, you can basically pause things, have it buffer the output between the filter and the aggregate, and then when that fills up, then you can say, okay, now you can start executing again, right? We talked a little bit about that when we did relaxed operator fusion. We talked about uh, vectorization and query compilation. Right? This is a paper that we wrote where, in order to maximize the, the vectorization between operators at the, when you're in a push-based model, you have a little buffer in between. So they can introduce that, but then not just fill it up and then pass it along. They can say, OK, well, this thing's not, not full yet. You're allowed to keep executing, or it is full. Let me go ahead and pause you. They can also do scan sharing, because all the, 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 the query plans are DAGs. Uh, so you could have a uh, you have your scan start producing results, fill up some buffers that you can then reuse for maybe this parent operator and this parent operator. Again, in a pool-based model, if you're calling get next, get next, get get next, every child has to have one one parent. So how do you how would you pass along that information? It would have to be this weird like side pa sideways information passing. So in this case here, they just fill the buffer up and say, okay, well the buffer's full. This 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 parent task can run. Okay, then, then before I throw away the, the intermediate result from this, this child, let me go and invoke the other one. And again, through the centralized coordinate, coordinator, you, you can turn these things on and off as, as needed. Right, and then the last one is, uh, if you recognize that the, 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 the operators on the top of the query plan can't consume or process the data you're passing up as quickly as possible, you can just pause things, right? So you can introduce a buffer here that says, okay, when this thing gets more than 10, me more, more 10, more than 10 megabytes, uh, even though I have more memory, I could, I could keep going. But rather than let this thing balloon indefinitely, I just can pause the whole pipeline and just don't let any more tasks execute for it. The other one is also super useful is like, because again, you're reading, reading, reading remote data like over HTTP, uh, instead of having like this entire task just paused while, you know, in the thread being blocked while you're fetching this, you do the background IO fill up some buffer, and then when the data is available, then you can kick off the execution again. Again, think about how you would do that with, with get next. Like, I would have to have, uh, I call get next down here. They make a remote call at HTTP to go get some data, and then I need a way to go back up and say, okay, I, I don't have the data you're looking for, uh, but call me back again when, when it's actually available. You have to make another get next call. It, it gets really awkward and weird. Um, whereas the push-based model, because now the control flow and the data flow are, are separate, this makes this all uh, much easier to do. All right, the next thing that's interesting is how they, uh, what their intermediate uh, result vectors look like. So there's the, there's the data, obviously, on disk. We'll talk about it in a second. Like, that's going to be more heavily compressed because um, you want to reduce the, the, the size of, of, of the data itself. But once everything's in memory, when you're going from one operator to the next, they want to do a lightweight encoding, similar to what we talked about before, 
to pass data from one operator to the next. And they're basically going to have uh, four vector types that are specialized, or three of them are specialized to different types of data. So without any compression, they, they call the vector uh, uh, uncompressed or flat, and it's just, just the listing in columnar order of, of the values. But if they recognize that within the, within the vector you're passing along, it only has one value, then rather than passing along that repeated value over and over again, they can have what's called a constant vector. And it's just a single value that says this entire vector has you know, 1,000 tuples, and they all have one, you know, one single value. They have a dictionary vector, like we talked about before. Right? The, the selection vector just says what offset in the dictionary corresponds to the data that you're looking for. And they have what, what they call as a sequence uh, vector, which is basically some variation of, uh, of, of a special case of delta encoding, where you have the starting value as the base, uh, and then you just say for every single value that comes after that, incremented by, by this amount. Right? So if you have like a, um, sometimes you have auto increment keys as the primary key for a column. Or like a sequence, so it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you recognize that, then you, you just need to store two values to say, uh, here's the base and here, here's how it's being incremented. So again, they'll figure this out on the fly uh, while you're actually processing the data, like between one operator and the next. Like, oh, which of these 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 versions you can use, um, and then the default is always fall back to flat because it's just the, the simplest one. So their actually in-memory layout is they actually designed this in conjunction with Velox. So they're actually compatible with the vectors that Velox passes around. And again, at a high level, it smells like arrow. But my understanding, it's not exactly uh, completely 100%. The memory layout isn't 100% compatible. So now the challenge, though, is that because it's a pre-compiled uh, primitives, if you have all these different variations of these, these different vector types, for all the different possible combinations of data types you could have, now you have this combinatorial explosion of the number of possible uh, uh, you know, primitives you would, you would actually need. And even if you, if you templated everything, now this is going to balloon up your, your code base when it gets compiled, uh, which makes comp compilation slower, but also makes, expands the, the size of the code in, in memory. It right? makes the process more heavier. So what they want to do for three of these vector types is that they want to get them into what they call a unified format where there is a, now you have a single primitive that knows how to do whatever processing you need on that, on that data without having to do any conversion or memory copying. So for the flat one, it's super easy because it's just exactly the same. Uh, but then now they're going to add this, this the selection vector just to say, here's the data. And then for the, you know, here's the offset that corresponds to the, the data that, that, that the tuple that offset matches for. Right? And that looks a lot like dictionary encoding. So this is actually how, how they'll, they'll represent things in memory and pass things along. Uh, and then now they don't have to decode it if, if, if you know, they're matching up against another dictionary one. For constant, same thing, right? It's basically dictionary encoding. Like I have, uh, uh, that's backwards, sorry. Yeah, sorry, that's constant. For the constant one, again, it's just I have this single value as my data as, a, as, a, as if it was a dictionary. And then here's the selection vector, which is all zeros because they're all pointing to the same one. And then the dictionary one, it's basically the same thing. So again, like even though they have different compression schemes for, uh, for these different uh, three different vector types, the, the sequence ones, I think they always have to unroll into uh, the flat one. But all this looks the same now, and then you have a primitive that operates exactly on this, on this data. And you don't have to do any extra memory copying. And you get the benefit of like, oh, if it's constant, you know, you're, you're passing along less data than before. So this is what they call the unified, uh, unified vector format. And again, this is for the intermediate results that are going from one operator to the next. But the increment one? The increment one, I, I think they have to unroll it. But I'm, I'm, that, might, that might be a year out of date. I haven't looked. All right, so the other interesting thing that, that, that we're talking about at DuckDB, that we haven't really talked about before, um, is how they, inter, you know, the, they can work with this you know, the, the non seco ecosystem that data scientists are commonly using. Um, and so, you know, if you think of like Python pandas, people are operating on, on data frames, and they want to, you know, data frames provides this API to do the manipulations, but at a high level, it basically looks like relational algebra. Um, and so what they want to be able to do is, for people that can link in or, or you know, instantiate DuckDB within their Python or R program, write to some common API uh, based on data frames, 
and then have that get translated into the corresponding SQL command uh, that can then retrieve the data that, that you're looking for. And so there's, they, they support two different libraries, one for R, one for Python. One's called dplyr, and the other called ibis. Ibis was developed by the guy that invented Apache Arrow. I forget where dplyr came from. Has anybody ever heard of these before or no? No. Um, I can show you what it looks like. Um, but basically, it's a, again, it's a, it looks like if you ever used like Spark, uh, PySpark, and things like that, right? It's going to have the, you know, APIs that, that manipulate data frames like this, right? And, and sort of like this. You fetch some things, get the head, right? And then this is the output. So again, it's, like the, it's a procedural language to manipulate data frames, which, which are just basically relations or tables in a database. Um, and then right, with dplyr, sorry. What's wrong? Yes? Is data frames um, something that is built on top of Apache Arrow, or is it the other way around? Like, like Apache Arrow integrated data frames into Spark? His question, his question is, is data frames, like what came first? Is to Apache Arrow in some way? Or uh, like, and, so data frames came from, came from Pandas, I think. Right. And the guy that invented Pandas also invented an Arrow. Right. Yeah, so that, that's the connection there. But like the idea, like through like the Pandas API or dplyr or Ibis, like you can you can manipulate what you think are data frames in memory uh, that could be though in the Apache Arrow format. Because um, the whole point is like like again going back to that paper you guys read, don't hold my data hostage. Like they make a big deal of like okay, well if you just use JDBC to go run some query on a database, you're gonna get back back a bunch of rows. And then if you're using like pandas or some Python program, then that's got to then do a pivot, convert it now to a, a column store. So what you really want to do is hand things off as arrow, and then now your, your Python code or R code can manipulate directly on, on those arrow, buff, arrow buffers, even though you're still operating on, on the data frame API. So that's the idea with, with these uh, integrations is that, uh, maybe the deep pile one has it. First scroll down. Like you see they have these basic primitives. Um, and then they have different backends, and then here's the, the one for, for DuckDB, right? Drop and replacement for, for dpiler that use the same, same API, but what's gonna happen is when I write code against this thing, uh, it's actually not gonna generate SQL. Where is something to look at? Right, yeah, so here, like, uh, that's the data frame. Ah, here's the query, yeah, so here's some query here. There, it, it more or less looks like some you know, bastardized version of SQL, which is, you know, instead of where calls, it's called filter, right? Instead of average, it's called mean. But it, it, at a high level, this basically looks like SQL. And so what these integrations do with, uh, with DuckDB is that instead of converting these commands into SQL, the, 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 the library will convert this action to a logical plan of the internal representation that, that, that DuckDB has for queries. And then, like, as if it got parsed from, from, from the SQL from the command line or whatever, and then it hands that off now to the optimizer who can then convert that to the physical plan. Yes? Do people hate writing SQL that much? The statement is, do people ha hate writing SQL that much? Um, you're talking the wrong dude. Uh, so, I mean, no, so, we, so it's, it's similar to what we saw with UDS, right? There's certain things that are hard to express in, uh, in SQL. Yeah, there are, but like, yeah, so like, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of data scientists that prefer to use pandas and, and Python APIs and Python notebooks. Uh, and certainly for some things, like, it doesn't make sense to run that in the database. Like, if you're going to call it PyTorch stuff, like, it may not make, make sense to have that run the database system. You could run that locally or farm it out to, to, um, to like, Spark. And actually, that's one of the, one of the, you know, one of the advantages of, of like, Databricks, although, uh, Snowflake has, has um, Snowpark, I forget what the Google one is, like this, this, this single environment where you could do, run your SQL query on like the OLAP engine, plus also run like scale out machine learning jobs all together in sort of one, one interface. That's, that's very common now. But it's also very common like, you know, for, for just, if you're running like a one-off experiments, just to download the whole file locally, crunch on it using Python, and then maybe upload results or hand it off to somebody else. So the idea here is now like instead of having uh, like the pandas runtime is actually very slow, but instead of you, so now if you want to manipulate data frames, if you put your data in like parquet files, 
then let DuckDB do the crunching of those Parquet files instead of Pandas itself, and you get all the advantages of you know, a modern OLAP system that we've been talking about the entire semester uh, directly in your Python notebook. So that, that's, that's the idea here, right? And again, it's the zero copy is, is the big idea. This is what Apache Arrow sort of, uh, this is what the, was the original foundation or the motivation of Apache Arrow, that you could pass around data between you know, disparate you know, applications running the same, uh, same address space without having to do serialization or deserialization. But now, as I said, it, it's basically being used as the transport uh, protocol or, or you know, format between different nodes running in a system, right? So, but in this case here, I think DuckDB is in process. You can get data in and out of DuckDB, back and forth between DuckDB and, and Python R through these different APIs through all Apache Arrow. Because again, same address space. If I malloc in DuckDB and hand you some buffer, uh, you know, how you actually keep track of who has to free it, that's a, that's a separate thing. But like, I don't have to do a mem copy to, to be able to manipulate it in Python. DuckDB also supports the execution of uh, substrate plans as well, but I think that's done through, that's done through an extension. Um, so I think you can take a substrate serialized plan and then hand it to DuckDB just as if it was a logical plan generated by one of these guys, and then it'll convert it to its physical plan that, that it can then execute. Um, so this maybe, I mean, it sort of goes back to the very beginning we were talking about before, like, like that, that Reddit post like quality of life things or like the ease of use. Like if I have a bunch of Python notebooks uh, and I want to use some data that I have stored out in, in my object store, but I'm going to be able to run them in, uh, you know, like an OLAP engine or something like that. Uh, if I can reduce the friction, how much manipulation I have to do for this existing code, uh, that, then that, that's a better user experience. Instead of saying, okay, rewrite all your Python stuff to SQL. Like no one's going to do that willingly. All right, so I've already sort of mentioned multiple times that like DuckDB does support reading a bunch of different file formats that we, we've covered, but it also has its own proprietary custom file format. Um, similar to like, you know, if you create, you know, open up SQLite and you call create table, it'll write out like a .db .sqlite file. You'll get the same thing DuckDB. It has its own uh, proprietary file format. It's meant to run as, as a single, you know, generates everything as a single file. Now when you do updates on it, just like in SQLite, they'll maintain a, um, I maintain a write ahead log as a separate file. And for temp files or temp data, that'll get split to a separate files as well. But the core database itself that you attach to is always gonna be a single file. So no surprise, it's gonna be packs. Their row group is set to be 120,000 uh, tuples. And the important thing to understand is that they're gonna be more ag aggressive with the, the compression schemes that they're gonna use when it goes to disk versus when it's in memory. In particular, they're gonna do bit packing or the frame of reference optimizations that, that we talked about before. So when you actually start writing data at the disk, right, think, think you know how much inserts are copying into DuckDB that then writes out to the database, they're going to do something sort of similar we saw with, with, with better blocks where they'll have sort of an initial pass to look at the data, figure out what it looks like, use some kind of ranking algorithm to, to, to decide which is the best, you know, most efficient encoding scheme for, uh, for that data. And then once they figure it out, then they compress it and then write it out to disk. And they're going to do this on a per column basis, I think, within a, within a row group itself. So this table is a bit out of date. Uh, this is from 2022. But you can see over the years, uh, over the different versions, where they've added different compression schemes. And even the, the latest one, I think, just came out in March. Uh, they have uh, they had the latest compression scheme from another project at CWI called Alps that we didn't cover for floating point numbers. But you can sort of see how they compare against like, you know, base compression in Parquet with Snappy as the standard, uh, you know, for, for the different lightweight encoding schemes. Yes. Oh, well, sorry. The, the columns are these are different like well-known data sets or benchmarks. Oh, okay. So the tax. Line item is like TPCH. What's that? Yeah, line item, line item is TCH, TPCH. Taxi is the New York City taxi uh, database. It's like every single oh. taxi, every single taxi ride over like a one-year period. Uh, like and, and like what you know, the 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 pickup and the drop off location, um, and then on time. I, I think that's, that's flight data, but I'm not sure. But anyway, again, so again, this is this is the on disk format. They only have those four vector types once everything is in memory, because you want that to be that processing to go as fast as possible. 
So, so in addition to being able to support, again, reading their own proprietary uh, file format uh, on the local disk, as I said, they can read data in other file formats. Um, you know, Parquet is not surprising. I don't know whether they, I don't think they support ORC. Um, at least I don't see it here. Uh, they obviously can support Arrow. Um, another cool thing they can do is they can like, attach to a SQLite database and actually read that directly. And they can, can manipulate it directly. Um, and you know, you attach to the, to the database and you see it as if it was a, uh, you, know, you see the catalog, you see all the schema and everything. Like, you know, from, you, from your perspective, you don't see that, you don't know that it's, it's actually SQLite data, a SQLite database versus a, uh, versus a uh, DuckDB database. They also support, you know, obviously reading JSON. And then the, for the Postgres one, they, I, I think they connect to the Postgres over like JDBC. But again, the, it, it, it sucks in all the catalogs. So within DuckDB, you can see all the, the tables you have in, in Postgres and, and run queries on them. But I don't know how much it, like, they, they push and pull between pushing down the query into Postgres versus sucking the data in and running more quickly in, inside of DuckDB. Because right? the DuckDB uh, query engine is going to be way faster than, um, than Postgres for doing analytics. So these are the, if you call from, it's hard to see, from DuckDB extensions, like this will give you all the, the listing of the, the official built-in ones um, and whether they're loaded or not. And as I was saying before, they're trying to minimize the, 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 sort of the, the size of the core engine uh, binary itself for not bringing in additional binaries or additional code. Uh, but they, if you do need it, then you get it through, through these extensions. One in particular is, is ICU. Like that thing is super important. That's like the international like timestamps and time zones and things like that, and date formats. Uh, that one you don't want to write yourself. The Germans did. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but like so, but, you, but a lot of people need it. So like you get it through one of these extensions because it's going to be a third party library. The Germans told me that one time they were going to do a sales call. This is back when it was hyper, and they needed uh, the customer. They were literally on the plane flying to meet some customer. I don't know where in Europe. And uh, they were running queries with the ICU library, and it was super slow. So then Thomas, within the flight, without internet, rewrote the ICU library on the flight, and they had it you know, 10 times faster when they landed. <laughs> Insane, right? So the one I want to point out, though, here is, is this one called Mother Duck. And again, this is like, if you just download Duck, DuckDB, and you call show extensions, these are all the things you, you, can, you can get. And I think some of these, again, they're not, they're not shipped in the binary. You say load them, it'll, it'll pull them down from the DuckDB website. But this one here, again, this DuckDB, sorry, this, this comes along with this thing called Mother Duck. So what is that? Yes? How does the extension, extension work? Like, is it like DuckDB, um, like a library you call from another process? So how, how do you load, like, load the uh, uh, extension? How do you load these extensions? Yeah. It's shared objects. You call load and then uh, load or create extension, the name that you want, and then I think it, it, it'll pull it down for you. From the like, website. Like there, there is a process. Uh, I think when you call create extension, yes. Uh, okay. I, I think. Because um, I, I think the binary, you know, when you download it, it's not that big. So it's not like install, create install, it's like um, you, yeah, it's I, not an extension on the flight. Correct, yes. Okay. It's, it's, I think, actually, I think that, I think some of them are shipped with it, but they're, you know, they're not, they're maybe not loaded automatically. Um, I mean, some of these say, say built in. And that would be equivalent to like in Postgres, within the Postgres source tree, they have a contrib directory, and that has like official third party extensions that are shipped with Postgres itself. But obviously, for things like PG Vector, you just download that from GitHub and install it yourself. So they, it's a similar model. I think you can do on the fly. Like, while, while it's like running, you can just bring stuff in. Yeah, you can, of course. You can do that in Postgres too. It's just linking in a shared object. And then that shared object has to implement this general extension API to know the entry point when you want to invoke something. Yeah, that's, yes. The question is like, <coughs> I think maybe you're asking like, when you download DuckDB and get the executable, does it come with these built in? I think some of them, yes. Other ones, I, th I think you get from their, their website. There actually is a, at least one extension that can't be loaded during runtime. There's one that overrides the malloc implementation. <laughs> overrides the what, sorry? The malloc implementation. It gives you Joey uh, malloc. Joey malloc? Yeah. yeah, but that's, Comes with it automatically. Oh. Yeah, we. Sorry, we don't. It actually, does not say that. We don't really talk about malloc. Um, 
You never want to use libc malloc for your database system. Uh, you always, almost always want to use JE malloc. Uh, in rare cases, you maybe you maybe want to use TC malloc. And that one's from Google. JE malloc is from um, Facebook, Meta. It's just like, it's, it's, it's just way more efficient. It's less, um, it's more scalable for multiple cores. Like it takes less, the latches are less expensive. Um, TC malloc is thought to be better for, uh, for multi-threaded applications, if you have a lot of cores. But JE malloc is always the, the right choice. All right, so it, it, pretty much everyone uses, uses this in their data system. Um, we didn't talk about huge pages. That's another one that most systems don't do that. But you, you never want to use transparent huge, huge pages in the OS. That's always a nightmare. Um, but I think it's gotten better. We, but you know, we can talk about it. I, if people are curious about these things, we can talk about it a bit more. But when in doubt, just use JE malloc, yes? Libc, question, what's the big, what is the big problem with libc malloc? Yeah, because of like the what, pages when you have to No, no, because there's too many latches inside of it. No, latches. Right, JE malloc, is, JE malloc is specifically designed for like taking lightweight latches, small critical sections to be able to scale out multiple cores. Any reason why like, it's not like, on the default uh, Linux? The question is, why, is there any reason why it's not the default in Linux? Yeah. Uh, like why would anyone use malloc? Like? I, to be clear, like, JE malloc is not, it wasn't written explicitly for databases, which is all the databases people use it because it's much better. Uh, pretty much any high performance application is going to use JE malloc. Then why have malloc? Um, Legacy? I, Single core performance? I, that, that one, I, we can look at it. I have no idea. Right? Licensing, maybe licensing issues. Maybe this is like MIT and it has to be GPL or whatever. Um, yeah, there, we, there's a paper we, um, we, didn't, we didn't read this year. Uh, but this is, there's a system called Scuba at, uh, at Facebook. And basically, it was an in-memory database. And one of the things they do is uh, they want to do rolling upgrades. They want to restart the server. So they, since it's an in-memory database, if I kill the process and start it back up, I got to load all the, the data back in. So the trick they do is they write everything, all the contents of memory to shared memory in the OS, kill the process, come back, reattach to that shared memory, and everything's there. And they, they talk about how they tried having, because they own the, they own, they, they employ the person that writes JE malloc. Um, they had them try to write some tricks in JE malloc to make it better so they could share memory and restart. And it was a huge nightmare. And for that case, they just relied on the OS to do it. Um, but so, so there are some optimizations, I think, in JE malloc that are specifically for databases uh, that are relevant. Because I know Facebook puts stuff in there. Yes? Also, libc malloc is, is used because it uses less memory. JE malloc uses a lot of memory. It uses a lot of memory. I mean, eagerly allocates ahead of time. Yeah. Get, just, just use JE malloc. All right, sorry, yeah. So this mother duck thing, what is that? So the, this is during the pandemic. The Hannes and Mark were thinking about doing a startup on, on DuckDB, uh, but, they, but at least when I talked to them, what they really wanted to do is just keep building DuckDB uh, you know, as is, running on you know, embedded devices and so forth. Um, and all the VCs were one of them to make a cloud version of it where to, that, that end up looking something like, like Snowflake. Um, but that would be, again, a major rewrite and go against the ethos of the original design of, of DuckDB. So there is DuckDB Labs, and that's basically the spinoff of CWI that is doing most of the development on, on DuckDB and employs all, a bunch of former students, Mark and Hannes, to build, keep you know, building DuckDB. And that's where you get official, if you need official support for DuckDB, you contract out to them. Then uh, a year or two ago, there was a spinoff. Uh, there, 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 was a, there was a startup that was, that was created called Mother Duck to provide a cloud version of DuckDB. But again, it's not a, it's not a scalable, you know, scale-out version of DuckDB like a Snowflake or a Dremel. Instead, it's more like a rem remote compute option that you can get now in DuckDB where you still run DuckDB locally, but if your data is already in the cloud, you basically can run a query locally that then gets shipped over the wire to Mother Duck, who's running DuckDB there, and do some processing, and then send back the result to you. All right. So again, going back here, when you download DuckDB, this, this comes along with it. This, you know, this official Mother Duck extension. Uh, and so that means everybody that's running DuckDB now can connect directly to, to, to Mother Duck, assuming they have account and API key. And so 
the mother duck sends down to the local DuckDB, like here's the catalog of everything, all the files that I have available, and then I can write queries on them as if it was a local file, and the, the system figures out what part of the query needs to run in the cloud and what part of the query needs to run, run locally. Um, yes? Why would someone use this instead of like a, uh, any other OLAP system? So question, why would anybody want to use this versus some OLAP system? Yeah, that's on the, because all of them have cloud offerings. Uh, I mean, again, but if like, if you're already like doing much analytics locally in DuckDB, Right, because it connects to Python or whatever, like to, to stop that whatever you're doing, then switch over to BigQuery, and, and where the query might not actually work anymore. You might even not even running SQL anymore. Like you, you can using Ibis or Dplyr, right? right? So it's like it's just like it's a seamless integration. Like it's still the DuckDB client side interface, but like you don't know necessarily where that query is going to run anymore. Yes. This question, is there any, will it, split, will, will it scale horizontally to multiple nodes in the cloud? As far as I know, at least the current version, no, right? Is there a reason why not? This question, is there a reason why not? Because yeah, you'd have to rewrite a lot of DuckDB to make that work, right? Maybe you could just, well, if they're just sending the query plan out to the cloud, maybe you could identify pipeline breakers, yeah. write out parts of the query plan, into different, and then just run different DuckDB instances. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, so, so to his point, actually, you're right. They, they could do that. I don't know whether they do that, though. I'll show that in the next slide. Uh, basically, they, they know what parts are remote and local, and then the, the, the local DuckDB instance is responsible for figuring out, OK, like, this data is remote, and it's too big for me to suck, suck down locally, so I'll send my, query, my plan fragment over there and process it and get back the result. So yes, in that point, you could say, OK, I, I could take portions of this and fan it across multiple DuckDB instances. I, I, I just don't know whether they do that or not. Right, so, so this, is, this is from the, the paper that came out this year. Right? The idea is that, again, you have the client side the duck, of DuckDB. You install that, that mother duck extension uh, that then can send query plans up to the mother duck cloud service where you, they're running DuckDB inside of Docker containers. Um, that, and they're doing client side caching similar to what we saw in, I think, in Dremel. Sorry, 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 in, in Snowflake. And then, of course, you can always read data from your object store, whatever you want. Right, and how 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 the clients sorry the the the, the mother duck service is aware of what data is in here. I think they can connect to Iceberg and, and other things to suck out that metadata as well. So the the way this is going to work is that they're going to introduce what they call a bridge operator in the query plans now that is capable of sending uh, sending and receiving data from the the local DuckDB instance to the cloud version of it. Um, and so again, when you invoke a query on the, on the local side, uh, it'll do all the planning that it normally would. And then with the mother duck extension installed, they'll then take a second pass on it and say, OK, well, this data you're, looking, you're trying to access in this pipeline is local. This data is remote. Uh, and then they do a you know, cost calculation to decide, you know, is it better to push the query to the data out on the remote storage or pull the data down to the, the local machine? So say I'm doing a join between some customer table and a sales table. The customer table is remote. The sales table data is local. And so say the customer data is, is huge, um, which is typically the opposite of this. The sales one is always much, much bigger. right? Um, so DuckD would say, OK, well, I, since I already have the customer data and that, that's remote, let me go send the, the, the sales data uh, over, over the wire up to the remote service. The remote service then computes the hash join using the DuckDB instance that's running on the cloud. Then it has to get the result back to you and the client, so then they send, send the, the data back. So they added like, you know, source and sync operators in between these things. Again, now you see again, they don't have to do anything extra to, to support this in terms of, uh, of, of scheduling and, and, and running these pipelines because we just made a big deal about how they switched to the push-based model. They can pause things and do asynchronous I.O because now the control flow is separate from the data flow. So I can, uh, you know, I can, I can have this thing start running, sending data up, and uh, you know, n not have to like, you know, have this weird uh, call stack thing where I have to like, pause and unpause as I'm pushing data out. All right? And so that cost model for that second pass uh, to decide whether what runs remote and run local is based purely on 
not computational complexity, but transfer cost of the data, the transfer time of the data. Obviously, if I have you know, 10 terabytes in the cloud and a one kilobyte file locally, I don't want to suck down the 10 terabytes. I want to send the one kilobyte data up and run, run everything remotely there. Yes? Besides um, DuckDB having this, this client layer uh, that connects to the mother back into the Swift, what's the difference between this and something like Neon, where Neon is, is sort of equivalently like scaling out Postgres? I think they actually have a lot of horizontal like, auto-scaling going on, right? His question is, uh, what is the difference between DuckDB and Neon? I mean, Neon is doing, uh, Neon's taking, ripped out the storage layer of Postgres and, 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 and can make it, uh, make, basically make a shared disk architecture that can, can scale out horizontally. But I'm pretty sure that the compute side for the queries themselves are still run on a single node. So that would, that would look like this. So the horizontal scaling in that case is happening at the storage the, the horizontal scaling is happening at the storage layer. This is still, the mother duck uh, still runs DuckDB as shared nothing. So that's why it's uh, wait, 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 go back here. Sorry, you're saying that. Uh, oh, okay, well, that is clearly a shared disk. But, um, I'm just trying to understand why, this, why auto scaling isn't viable here, but something like Neon does. So I, so I misspoke. I don't know whether they're actually can, they're scaling horizontally on the compute side. But you could, do, as you said, you say, if I have like four pipelines that I'm all going to run remotely, instead of having them all be on a single instance uh, of DuckDB, you could have them run on multiple instances with separate well, containers. So you have like a million tuples and you split it 250, 250, 250, 250 on four nodes. Yeah, you could do that, yes. That too? Okay. Yes. All right, okay. I, I don't know whether they're doing that, though. Okay. I, that answers my question. Thank you. Um, I think, again, I think the initial version of it just, it's just, here's the whole, here's the, you know, here's the pipeline, just run it. Because you, you would need that extra step to say, okay, ch chop it up and, and scale it out, and then stitch it back together. And that's eventually they could do that, I'm sure. Um, the the neon architecture is more similar to um, like Aurora, that they you have a single uh, single primary where all the writes go to, and then you propagate the the updates through the storage layer, and then you can have read only replicas, you know, service service those queries. In a transaction consistent manner. So neon is more heavy on, uh, on like caching. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, I'm saying I'm saying that like the neon the neon is the neon's trying to have a you know primary multiple multiple replicas. So the primary get, absorbs all the writes because it's an OLTP workload, and then the changes get propagated to the replicas, and you can run read only queries on those in a transaction consistent manner or snapshot isolation. And then what, what Amazon does in, in Aurora is they, where Neon does all the, the that, that propagation of the, of the, of the updates through, uh, through code potentially sitting above the file system, Amazon puts that propagation like directly within like EBS itself. And they can do that because they control the whole stack. Not exactly directly in EBS, but just a little bit above it. Yes? This is a bit of a tangent, but just out of curiosity, if you do the primary thing, aren't you, you're doing eventual consistency rather than asset, right? His statement is if you're doing, if you're doing the, the, what I was saying before, you're doing the eventual primary, consistency. primary. Uh, no. No. Because okay. I, I could do a commit on the primary and then uh, not, not acknowledge the commit until all the replicas have acknowledged that they got the update. Oh, okay. Right? And then, but for, for, again, for read-only queries, sometimes you don't maybe need, you don't need that sort of strong consistency or, or the, the, the better, the higher guarantees, like snapshot isolation, uh, snapshot isolation might be enough. So I don't care that I'm reading data that's 10 milliseconds behind, right. as long as I have a, a consistent snapshot. That's a whole, yeah, yeah that's not this class. Um, okay. All right, so uh, to finish up my DuckDB, and then I'll talk about the worst database system, that, or the, wor the worst idea I've ever seen in a database afterwards. Um, I think DuckDB is amazing, right? The, the amount of adoption that they've, they've had in the last couple of years is phenomenal. And I think it was a combination of three things, right? It was, uh, they were at the right place at the right time where people, the pendulum has sort of swung back where SQL is the, now the default choice for a, a lot of applications. He was sort of asking why people would not want to write SQL. And that's a, that's a I think, an artifact of data scientists and the people in the NoSQL world eschewing SQL back in the day, but it definitely has, has changed over time. Um, so they were at the right time for this. They were solving the right problem. Like, hey, we need another, we, we need an embedded database to do analytics, not another Dremel, not another Snowflake. Um, and they basically 
borrowed, uh, took a lot of the ideas that the, the, the Germans were developing. I mean, Hannes is German, but I mean the, the Munich Germans, the hyper guys, took those papers and built an open source implementation of it. Um, and had Hyper Umbra been open source, I mean, the embedded, the, the embedded one is also, you know, that, that was a great idea too, like, you know, SQLite for analytics, to be an embedded database, Hyper and Umbra or not. Uh, so then the combination of like that packaging plus the ideas from Hyper and Umbra and improvements over, over it certainly, um, you know, it was phenomenal. That was a really good idea. And for me, like we were building a system that I wanted to be like, you know, you know have see adoption outside of CMU, but I was putting all my eggs in the basket on in-memory databases. Um, and that certainly did, did not pan out because DRM prices could have stayed stagnated and SSDs got really fast and really cheap. Um, and so in-memory databases aren't, you know, aren't in vogue anymore. Um, everything is, is always SSD based. So, and we had we had other complications that I, I can take offline. So again, I, I think DuckDB is a great system, and I use it. Like, this is my default choice of like, oh, I got a CSV, I got to you know do some analyzing on it. It used to be open up Excel or whatever, Google Sheets. Now it's DuckDB, right? So you should have that in your mindset. Like, like th throw DuckDB at everything for quick and quick and dirty things. All right. So next class, we're gonna read about Yellow Brick. Um, and as I said before, the reason why we're reading this, this paper, which also just came out in 2024, is they're going to do a bunch of low-level things that nobody else does. Uh, that we, we talked a little bit about throughout the semester, but you see how they're just going to be super hardcore about it. It's a very fascinating uh, system. And like I said, they have real numbers in there that nobody else does. Okay? All right, so I'll cut this. Um, the, worst, yeah. the worst idea I've ever heard.